Hello and welcome to today's uh, live chat, which is um, coming to you from inside the flat. And I've just realised how dark it is. So if you just wait there and start turning the light on, that would be perhaps much better. There you go. First live without me being inside. Somebody said to me yesterday, why don't I turn the uh, um, computer around so I've got the natural light from there? And um, the thing is, when I do that, it gets the sunlight gets in my eyes. So as I put the table here, uh, I don't think it was any better before. Though I think it's better like this with a sort of rather um, at least one side of my face you can see it. Okay, right. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to eighth uh, of May today, and I'm going to talk about the 9th of May. And all eyes will be on Red Square tomorrow to see what actually happens there. Now, the 9th of May is Victory Day in Russia. Why is it Victory Day? Well, that was the, the, the day which the unconditional surrender to the Soviet Union was signed by Nazi Germany, or what was left of Nazi Germany. Now, the thing about this Victory Day, though, or which fails to get um, much attention, is the fact that there were two countries which started the Second World War, one of which was the Soviet Union. Of course, it was Nazi Germany which started uh, on the 1st of September uh, 1939, but it was then the Soviet Union which attacked on Poland on the 17th of September of that year. Indeed, the Soviet Union, throughout its period of alliance with the Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, supplied it with um, uh, uh, um, goods and uh, services and uh, gave privileges to Nazi Germany, which were never given to the British and Americans in the period that uh, they were then became their allies. Uh, the, there was clearly the strong links uh, between uh, the Stalinist government and the Nazi government, and um, the fact that uh, Hitler then turned on Stalin. Stalin, uh, it would seem, for a number of days, he couldn't believe it. He went into shock, and he was, in fact, only pulled out of it when a group of people went round to see him. He, Stalin thought that they were there to arrest him, uh, but in fact, they, their idea was to form some kind of a committee for the defence of their country and put Stalin at the head of it. Uh, so um, Stalin couldn't believe that Hitler had betrayed him in this way. This is the same Stalin, of course, who had actually betrayed everybody that he'd come into contact with uh, nearly by 1939. There was hardly any of the old Bolsheviks were left. Stalin had had them murdered in show trials and the likes, and, um, and Stalin admired Hitler. He used Hitler, the period of alliance with Hitler, to attack six countries, and uh, so he took half of Poland, all of Lithuania, all of Estonia, all of Latvia, 10% of Finland, he intended to take the whole lot, and a very large chunk of Romania. So, uh, victory, of course, was the fact that he kept all of... Um, uh, the Romania, he kept uh, the occupation of the uh, Baltic countries, he kept all of Poland and added the rest of it uh, to it. Uh, and he, not only did he keep the bit of Romania he took, but he also added the entire country. Not only that, the Soviet Union then went on to occupy Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, um, a part of Germany and um, Hungary. So uh, that was the victory as far as they were concerned. Right, but I should say I'll talk about what it is today. Now, I personally haven't actually been to Moscow on Victory Day as such. I have, um, have been in, in, in Russia uh, several times. I actually spent quite a lot of time there. Um, but uh, the first thing, the first time I went to Moscow, the first thing that surprised me about Red Square was it sort of looks really big. Now, it's really big as far as squares go, but it looks much bigger on the television than what it really is. And, uh, the, and the strange thing is, well, so you've got the Red Square, you've got one end, you've got St. Basil's Cathedral, and then beyond that, you've got the Moscow River. So at that end, there's plenty of room, but at the other end, it's the entrance seems to be very narrow. It seems to be very narrow, I mean, there's, 
Um, and the first time I, I, I was there, I said, are you sure that they get all those tanks down that street there? It doesn't look big enough to pour it still. Then again, they've had uh, 100 years to practice it, so they seem to do relatively well with it on, on that. Now, as far as um, the Soviet Union was concerned, the 1st of May was it, the International Workers' Day, and so that was really important. We had the day um, when the revolution happened, so in November, so that's really important. Uh, the Victory Day was of less importance. Now, since the Putin regime came in, one thing they don't want people doing is revolting. And uh, so... Uh, the, 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 the revolution is really downplayed. For example, we had the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution five years ago, and you thought that they might have done something really big to celebrate. Now, you might think that, well, after all the things that went wrong during the revolution, um, you don't really necessarily have to celebrate it, but you could commiserate or something like that, or commemorate in some way, but they didn't do that. What they did was they more or less ignored it. Since Putin's come to power, the uh, focus is on uh, this victory, um, which of course for the 23 million, which I now say was killed, was not much of a victory. And the fact is that they were allies of the same Nazi Germany they beat, but anyway, okay, keep on going about that point. And uh, so they put a place in this, because this is put into the nationalist argument we've got a big country we're really uh, big on tanks and things like this so the fact that you don't have access to hospital care the roads are full of holes and you've got to work very long hours that is uh, that's the price of having these big tanks and so that's what it's all about now there's of course another advantage of having all these big tanks for the people in charge, and that is the fact that they can then, um, they have the big tanks, they can control the population, they can steal from the uh, from the Russian people, and then they can send this money to uh, buy property in London and football teams and send it off the Cayman Islands and Switzerland and the United States and all things like that. Hello, George in uh, Melbourne. Hello. So, um, the... Um, uh, the whole point, I think, of this 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 victory celebration is to reinforce the nationalist um, message, and so this is what the whole thing is about. In fact, it's not really um, a uh, celebration of beating uh, the national socialist Germany. It is a way of saying it was something we won. We one, uh, even though the people who have long been dead, and at the uh, um, at the same time, hello to Phoenix, <laughs> thanks for watching. And at the same t at the same time, it is to promote its own idea of national socialism, but this time with a klepto kleptomania um, idea all behind it. Now tomorrow, then there is going to be. On it, say today's the eighth, tomorrow's the ninth, and uh, so there will be a big celebration. Well, the first thing is, will Putin be there? And one thing I've noticed about Hello Isa, uh, about Putin is that uh, he hasn't shown himself to be particularly brave uh, in the past, and like, like um, nothing unusual about that. Most of the dictators aren't particularly brave people, Hitler certainly wasn't. Uh, Stalin certainly wasn't, and um, so, but will, I've got a feeling he mightn't even turn up for it. Now, of course, security is going to be really, really strong, but I mean, this does, Putin hasn't uh, presented himself in public since this war of aggression against Ukraine started, so um, he is presenting himself as a target, a rather juicy one at that. And oh, thanks, George, <laughs> for, for being interested. And um, so the uh, I'm sure that his security would be really tough and all the rest of it. But you know, if somebody does want to have a Gordon, 
and then I'm, I'm sure this will have been thought out. And this is one reason why I suspect he might send somebody there in his place. Now, he's got a couple of other reasons uh, for doing so. Hello, Andrew. Uh, the, um, the, the, if he's not there, uh, that gives him an excuse not to come up with a speech. So he's going to have to announce something. I think. I mean, and it's not good enough to say happy half birthday to me because it would be my half birthday. So, uh, so um, that wouldn't that wouldn't be sufficient. You have to come up with something. And um, now uh, there are there are other people, such as the former U.S. president, who would have uh, who would have thought of some some spin that he actually had won. Uh, or was winning this war, but I don't. I can't honestly see what Putin can do. Now, there's been a lot of talk about would he declare war. Now, in fact, there is a war, so let's not pretend there isn't one. Uh, it is a war, even if I were in Russia right now, I'd look at 15 years imprisonment for for saying this. Um, uh, if he if he declared war, then the first thing would, that this would do is so that he could no longer put people away for 15 years for saying that there was war on. Uh, the second thing is uh, this would allow him to mass mobilize the population, and on the point one point would be that there could be massive conscription. At the moment, Russian troops are actually outnumbered. But, and this is the important thing with, with military things, uh, the, the important thing is concentration. And when I say outnumbered, if you include the, uh, the Ukrainian territorial uh, forces, which are spread throughout the country. So if you go there, the people who are stopping you are probably uh, Ukrainian uh, territorial uh, so stopping. I mean, they, they do they searches all the time. So I mean, they do document checks. Sometimes they're quite nice, but other the times they're a bit nasty. But um, so, so these are ter mainly territorial pieces. That, uh, this advert the territorial service all over the place, and people are joining up. Uh, just about everybody I met was was in the territorials. So, um, uh, oh, sorry, men, uh, or so, some women as well. And uh, I can't say I did. It's not a, a huge amount of people that I spoke to, but I mean, of those I did speak to, um, that, that this was the. This was the situation. So um, I don't really know, uh, with no insult intended, of course, but I don't know if we can call these territorials as being sort of um, trained soldiers. But but if we include them, then the Ukrainians outnumber the Russians. Now, on a population scale, the, the population of Ukraine is approximately, what, three and a half times less than the population of Russia, so somewhere around that, 160 million Russian society comes, but 44 million, uh, 45 million Ukrainians. Of course, uh, many of the Ukrainians have now, um, some is about 11 million of them have been displaced, so then that would obviously be a, a lower um, amount. Um, anyway, so um, if this happened, the problem with this is that then you would have a situation, now imagine it, now I'm at the age now that of having somebody who would uh, a son of military age what would i do um there's absolutely no way i want my son going off to fight and um at all and and, and i'm ex army so um uh, they the uh, i think what a lot of people are trying doing is trying to get their kids out now there's still ways out of russia you can get a train to finland you can, get, uh, you can go to Georgia, you can go to Uz uh, Uzbekistan or, or Kazakhstan or Kazakhstan and drive over the border. Although it's a long way to get there. So there's plenty of ways of getting out. And this was what I think would happen during the Vietnam War. Of course, we had many people go off to Canada. I knew people who went to Canada. Um, sorry, I wasn't among them during the Vietnam War. Point about it, they told me <laughs> later they went to Canada. And um, this would be a huge embarrassment. And not only that, if they start doing things like mass mobilization, this has economic effects. That means to say that, for example, if you're an um, uh, engineer or driver or, or, or the personal services your car has got to go off the fight, then that these people are not actually producing for the economy. And that has a knock-on effect. Now, it's, for example, in Ukraine right now, this is going to have a major effect on the economic uh, the, uh, the economic standing of the country. You know, as I saw things, it seemed relatively normal in Ukraine. Um, the, I didn't see uh, shortages or uh, anything like that. But uh, then again, I didn't have to get my car fixed. I didn't have to um, 
or anything like that. So I, I really I can't I can't see the the logistics bits and the shops are open and the uh, stuff they sell in the shops was was there and the food food was there. So that it seems to me to be that that working, but I think it will um, uh, become a, a, a problem. Uh, George asks, "What's the best way to resolve this problem?" Well. This is the problem is to actually try and put yourself into the mind. The, the, the way to resolve this problem is only one way as far as uh, the West is concerned, and that is to ensure you bring in people. There, there's no other way. But let's put it from the opposing point, point of view. Let's, no, sorry, let's do a chess move now. When you play chess, you always think what the other person's going to do and what we, you're going to do. And then you try and counter the, the moves accordingly. What can Putin do? Hello, Otto. Um, what can what, what what can he do? As far as the situation is now, he is he's a dictator. He promotes himself as a strong man, so that's why he poses without a shirt on, uh, bareback riding, and going into the uh, Black Sea and pulling out Greek amphora and all the rest of it. He does this for a reason. It's just, it's a strong man, tough man. This type of type of thing. He cannot be seen to back down or to lose. It's not like um, you can get some politicians and they will be honest um, and they will say, and so rather than spin it, they'll say, yes, it was a bad night. We lost. John Major, former British Prime Minister, I've got a lot of admiration for him. He was like that, in my opinion. He was he was very honest. Some would say he wasn't, but I think he was. And um, yeah. so, yeah, um, this... In his case, he cannot actually do that. He can't put any spin on it. Um, the, so so can, he, he just cannot back down. This is the problem. And the, So the way of ending the war is to get rid of Putin. Well, the, the Russians have to do this. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know. Corey's just said, if the news is correct, Putin was just in for surgery for cancer treatment. I would have to say this about Putin. In my opinion, and you know, I'm a bit of a health freak. I'll show you how I'm a bit of a health freak. Here's some you know, things I do. With this here, and probably won't come up very well. This is black garlic. I actually produce this. I do. I make it, and um, I do. I, I eat functionally all sorts of odd things. Uh, this stuff's really tasty, but some of the stuff I like turmeric, raw turmeric, and uh, that's not typically not typically tasty. I just I, I eat things like that. Um, the I uh, so I Putin does lead a very healthy life, and um, so he, he appears to lead a very healthy life lifestyle, uh, except for one thing: he must be under a huge amount of stress. Now I, I can't say about the cancer thing, but <clears throat> around twenty oh I can't remember what it was now, about twenty twelve, he was in for plastic surgery. And of course, they denied it at the time, but it was quite it was quite obvious that it was it, it was plastic surgery, and he has to do this because he has to maintain his youthful appearance and his fit and all the rest of it. And so um, that's it. Right, so I just asked the question. It's not fermented, actually. It's called black garlic. We often use the word fermented, but if to ferment something slightly different. It's what's called the Maillard process where the, the, a, a constant temperature is actually kept for it for a very long period of time. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, what I do, I do is for, it, take, it takes 168 hours. That's a week, that's really fast. There's some places that do with black garlic over three months, but it's meant, maintained at the, a temperature, first of all, of around uh, 80, then it drops to 65, then it drops to 155 over this 168 hour uh, period and it comes out like this and it's super tasty it really is nice it's it's uh, really nice. it doesn't taste anything like uh, garlic if anything it's got this really fruity flavor and it tastes a bit like these um haribo this sort of thing the the um it, uh, it, 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 the, the sweets I, I really i really like them Anyway, sorry, so anyway, that, that came off the point. <laughs> I did a video on this five years ago. I never, still haven't, uh, I still haven't published it. Um, um, right, so, uh, yeah, so I don't believe 
that uh, Putin has been in for, in for treatment. Another thing is they did, they showed him holding, grabbing the table, and then in his foot moving. I've noticed other people, I, I know I don't do it personally, so now start what is trying to control or do myself, but I know other people that hold the table. I don't think it means they're ill or anything like that. Another thing they showed us, so his foot was sort of moving like this. Now, uh, if you ever see the picture of Hitler, uh, for example, um, when he, uh, in, in, in April uh, 1945, he goes out of the bunker to give some awards to some Hitler youth. And something you can see the bit that was taken out of the original newsreel, where he's got his hand shaking behind. I can't do it fast enough, but the the, the, the Parkinson's would probably was. It could have, it could have been something else. Um, but and, and people, I think when we're looking at Putin and hoping that he's that sort of ill. Um, things that Hitler had had all these problems. He had a dreadful diet. He had a dreadful lifestyle. Um, he had all sorts of stress because he couldn't he couldn't cope with the war. And despite this, he, I mean, admittedly, he didn't. He he, he was probably he aged about twenty five years more than he was. He was only fifty six when he died. I mean, just turned fifty six at that. He probably had a. But all the same, he did keep it up. So um, I, I, I would I would point that out. I personally, I mean, as much as I'd like to think that uh, that Putin was uh, was about to uh, uh, drop dead, I've got a bear, You know, he's only what's he sixty? He's seventy this year, so he's sixty nine now. Seventy in October, um, and he's clearly very very fit. And so when he's, when he's doing all this, you know, the, the hockey, and he started playing hockey in his late fifties. And uh, the the jujitsu and all the rest of it, you, you, you can't just that. Uh, you must be super fit. No, I do have. Occasionally, somebody's really fit gets ill. Um, a friend of mine uh, was really physically fit and he dropped dead at thirty eight. But um, so it does happen. Uh, but um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be lying that. Now, if Putin died, would this mean the end of the conflict? Depends who succeeded him. But uh, possibly, I think. I think we could hope. It's like when the, the, the July the 20th, 1944, when uh, Hitler was, um, if, if the bomb had worked, um, would it, would it have, uh, would it have um, uh, stopped the war? I mean, possibly, it might have, it might have done, it might have done. Um, depends who actually took over from him. If the plotters had taken over, if it had been Stauffenberg and all the rest of the others, then the war probably would have come to an end within the week. Uh, I would have imagined anyway. Um, so um, anyway, so uh, Andrew writes that uh, there's a lot of young educated Russian people leaving Russia to avoid possible conscription. Now, uh, this week, actually, I got a message from somebody in Russia and I, I tried to word it in such a way, uh, my response, uh, without actually saying it so that the person would understand what I meant. And uh, yeah, certainly, I mean, I, I really feel is that you know, we've welcomed all these Ukrainian people, but surely we can also help some of these Russian people as well uh, who want to leave. And um, particularly as the young, uh, in, uh, the, the Ukrainian people are generally not uh, eco um, as economically productive, let's say, as the Russians would be. And uh, so I, I really think that, that we could do that. I mean, the thing is, yesterday I saw some figures, and the figures came from the Russian Statistical Office of the amount of people who had left. And then they started adding them up. Now, I can't actually add them up because uh, I, uh, um, I wasn't actually expecting that question. So but, um, uh, it was roughly this, that 1% had gone to Georgia. Um, it was almost exactly 1%. There was, there was other countries, but I mean, the, the, the big ones, lots of people have gone to Estonia and Latvia. Um, above all, the, uh, oh, and Ukraine. Now, the, those have gone to Ukraine. Why did they go to Ukraine? This is the thing in the statistics. I don't know if this was counting those who had gone to war or what. But this came from the official Russian statistical service for the first quarter of this year. And another question is how many people have actually gone back? <clears throat> as, you know, as Georgia is the country that's usually quoted, and that's taken 1%. Of those who left, then then I, I don't really know that, how, how 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 valid that is, um, and uh, anyway, I, I hope that I honestly do that. Now Guillermo asks who's going to be uh, carrying the 
parade live. Oh, don't worry, somebody will be doing it. RT has rightfully uh, been taken off YouTube, in my opinion. I was on RT. Um, <clears throat> I was on several times on RT. <coughs> Sorry. And um, the last time I was on it, I was I was told what to say. Anyway, they must have been. They must have prepared this. They must have known that I would just say the opposite. And uh, I said the opposite. And, and the, the woman on the other side, the British woman, she was really good. She didn't miss anything. She came straight back with me with the, 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 not even changing the question. She wanted more information on what I just said. <clears throat> and um, uh, RT, I mean, it is, it's obviously just, it's just, it's just, and, um, when I said things, either A was what they wanted to hear the first time, then the second time it was things that which were sort of neutral, didn't make much difference. So I think they thought they got me. And then uh, when I didn't didn't say what they, they wanted, but I mean, they certainly do have people there who just say what um, RT wants them. Do so I was never paid by them, by the way. I didn't, didn't even give me money for my bus fare to go there, so to the studio. So I had to pay for I, I had to pay for, pay for everything. And um, anyway, so Otto's been reading about Russians who are using VPN connections to get the real news about Ukraine. Wonder when Vlad is escorted out of power, I hope soon. Yeah, I hope he's going to be escorted out of power soon as well. The thing with VPN connections is, I mean, I had problems using a VPN. So, I mean, how, um, how other people who are, I, I would say that on, on the level of tech savviness, I'm somewhere in the upper half, let's say. And uh, I had all sorts of problems using it. So um, and those are people who are less tech savvy. Uh, um, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure those who, who, who know how to use it are, uh, are doing well. Now, Otto also mentioned that Vlad has Parkinson's. I don't, I, as I said, no, I don't believe it myself. Um, um, anyway, so Guillermo says, why do people get off by making war personal and insulting the president of Russia? Why does it make you feel good? Uh, right, so um, why am I uh, insulting the president of Russia? In what way am I insulting the president of Russia? I am um, not. I saw. I saw this thing on YouTube. Uh, not, uh, not YouTube. It was on um, uh, on Facebook about the. It was a woman. Uh, this is a um, Nazi supporter in in Sweden. Um, uh, and she was insulting a Ukrainian girl, and she was sort of making the means, oh, you're so oh, you're disgusting. What, you're not appearing in such cheap clothes, and I bet your socks have got holes in them, things like this. And so sort of this was it. I, I, I failed to see how I am um, insulting Putin. What have I ever said that insulted him on a personal basis? I haven't said anything. I've said how much I admire his physique and um, his, um, his, his, his health. Anyway. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, Corey asks, if Putin can't leave Russia, who will take his place and uh, would he be tolerant? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a number of people who could, but I'd rather not even guess because um, the thing is this, it's not even clear. Because um, if we looked at other countries where there's this type of uh, dictatorships, I mean, North Korea, um, I think this thing stand at the moment pretty clear who would be uh, the next in line for the kingdom uh, there. Or if we looked at China, then, then I think it's, it's, relatively, it's relatively clear. In the case of Russia, there's no clarity on this one whatsoever. If, but what I would suggest is that it's likely to be somebody with, from within. It's not. It's not going to be. Um, we'll see Navalna or somebody like that um, um, becoming president. I mean, maybe we would if there were free elections. But the problem is this: there won't be free elections um, until such time as the, the current dictatorship can be overthrown. Then we're stuck with it. And uh, maybe it's now time for Putin to start thinking about his. Uh, um, his legacy and who's going to follow him uh, when uh, in the old days when there were kings and or kings and queens and many kings they would start thinking about producing a son and an heir so they could train to take over when they died hello Chris um, uh, Apke says they're all dead um, uh, I'm sad to hear you support taking down our T, I don't agree with you. Well, yes, but I mean, there's a war, this is a propaganda channel, and 
um, it, it's fact. I don't want to see fact space things taken down. But anyway, anyway, Guillermo has says I have an agenda, but these order to deleting information is wrong. It's an attack on my right to hear what I want to hear. So uh, right, okay. Um, uh, George writes, I know a lot of soldiers around the world and they do not want to fight and they're forced to fight. Hey, look, I was in the army, I can say this, is that sort of when you're 20 years old, then, then maybe you, uh, you do want to fight. And um, when you get a bit older or you've actually seen it, then you don't. Um, the, the, the thing is this, is, you know, I, I have, uh, mainly through, through this YouTube channel, I have had a lot to do with the Ukraine Foreign Legion. And I can say this of the people I've met, um, I can say I don't know any of them wanted to fight as such, but they felt they had it was their duty to to go and defend um, this, this European country, which had uh, which has been attacked, and uh, in this in this way. Um, so I mean, I've often likened it to the people who went to fight for Spain in the Spanish Civil War. Of course, this isn't a civil war. Uh, which is there, but I think uh, to a certain extent there were certain very similar things that people want to go in on mass. And what was one major difference is that the Spanish Civil War, very few people actually went there were trained soldiers. As far as Ukraine is concerned, um, they have to be trained soldiers. Uh, there'll be plenty of stuff there to do for those um, who uh, want to help in other ways, uh, but I think that's a lot of that's going to be after the war ends. But you can volunteer if, I, if you've got some skill. Uh, you can even be a driver or a baker or something like that. And then you could uh, go there and um, uh, to volunteer. And the, the thing is, the Ukrainian embassies are they haven't got a clue what they're doing. They just bang, bang you up with um, paperwork. Anyway, um, uh, so, so, so Guillermo writes, the second political opponent in Duma is the Russian Communist Party. People are aware of that. Well, I think they are. I don't think there's anything. Well, there's two other, effectively, there's two other political parties. There's what, what Russia today calls the Lib Dems, uh, which is a, uh, um, a new Nazi party, the leader of which uh, died last month. And uh, there's the Communist Party. In fact, the thing is, they were all three of them are more or less the same thing. It would, it would be, um, there's not much difference between them. So, I mean, it's not a real parliament as such. As much as it's, it's a parliament, as much as Hitler had a parliament or other dictators had parliaments, it's not. All, it's, uh, it's what Putin says goes the dictatorship. Um, be interesting to see uh, a psychological study of Putin. Is he psychotic? Uh, what was like as a kid, a bully? No, he wasn't, Otto. This is the thing. I mean, now, obviously, I, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I only, I only know what I read. But, I mean, I've read quite a lot of people, uh, what people have done. I and, mean, in fact, I have done um, video. I've been thinking of doing this uh, Putin's childhood video. Um, he, I did do the thing about, you know, he's chasing rats around and, and terrorizing the rats, but I've got a feeling a lot of us would have done that at, at his age. Um, he, he was probably bullied. He was probably the victim of, of, uh, rather than being the bully himself. And Putin's very small and uh, it's, he, 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 he can't have been particularly healthy living in the conditions that he lived in at the time. So he was born in 1952. They shared in a rundown flat uh, where the, there was only a communal toilet, there was a communal kitchen with one gas ring in, and it was completely in the dark. Um, and uh, there was next to no privacy. Uh, this is a tough background, and I suspect he wasn't a very strong uh, at all. I mean, also, this is Soviet Union in the 1950s. Uh, the, the, his area, as such, would, would have been his uh, the courtyard. So you've got the, flat, uh, the, the apartments, as such, or this former stately home, which had been converted into uh, apartments, and he was living in there. And... Um, he probably wasn't eating properly, uh, unable to get decent food. So I, I suspect um, and his parents were very poor. And so I suspect that uh, he wasn't in very good condition at all. And uh, I mean, his father was super, parents, both of them were super proud 
that he actually did um, he went to university. And um, there's another thing is about when um, they, they mollycoddled him. This is quite clear, both the father and the mother. But there was one. There was an account of how he actually went out, as, as lots of us probably did, at the same age. He went out in a day on the town, sort of. Um, and when he got back, his father gave him a right beating uh, because he'd gone off into the town out of the security of the uh, the courtyard um, uh, there. You can see the street he lived in. Today there's a museum in uh, the street and it's, very, it's really close to the church on the spilled blood, uh, which to me is one of the, you know, bang in the centre of Petersburg. I mean, I think it's, I've actually been in the street um, and um, I... I I didn't realise at the time, though, that, that was where we saw. I still don't suppose I'll actually be able to go something uh, that, that again. Um, anyway, I'm sure, though, um, the, the, in 1943, I think it was, uh, the first psychological profile was done of Hitler by what became the CIA. And um, so we did psychological profiles and other people, and I'm sure there is a psychological profile of him. I haven't read it. Um, sorry, so uh, Apke, whose real name I know, uh, said, let me say something about the trolls in infuriating against Ukrainians here in Poland and the government has just cancelled their free transportation without notice, but they want more cash from the EU. I didn't know that that was the case. I uh, just found that out. So here in Poland, um, uh, if you, um, actually, so Ukrainian females uh, can actually travel without charge. And not only that, they can go travel without charge. You can get to Germany, just doesn't cost anything there either, and then get to Holland. I don't know how it is, that, but I asked um, the um, the conductor, the ticket inspector, on the train, because there was, there was a couple of uh, ladies there from Ukraine and I was translating for them. I don't know, I'm sure the ticket inspector could, could have made himself understood. But anyway, and so I went up and I said, well, if we don't have tickets, uh, uh, they have to go to the, to the thing. You've got to prove that you're Ukrainian by showing you Ukrainian documents. I didn't know that uh, this had been cancelled in Poland. One thing in Poland, though, it's been is this, it's packed. The trains are Utterly packed. Now, I used train several times uh, last month. And um, there was even one thing. Uh, was I, I came back from Ukraine, got woken up in the morning by a cruise missile. Uh, then, then, so they were left that day and then got held at the border for a couple of hours. And then um, I was in Lublin, okay, quite good from Lublin to Warsaw. But then Warsaw, it was just like this night train. And I, was, I was really exhausted and there was nowhere to sit down. And I thought, look, I've already been up for 16 hours. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm normally in bed at nine o'clock and uh, never mind anything else. And today I got woken up by a missile. And um, uh, any, uh, anyway, so it was packed full of Ukrainians. Fortunately, I had a word with the ticket inspector and he got me a seat. So it was, as it happened, it was, it was, uh, it was all right. Anyway, so I'm sorry, I, I, have, I have noticed there are trolls here in Poland, but I mean, fortunately, uh, fortunately, maybe it's not as bad as it could be. I did notice, of course, that the former uh, head of the uh, IPN, supposedly the Institute of National Remembrance, it's the historical documentation side and the people who uh, uh, allegedly invest, well, not allegedly because I know they do invest, uh, did investigate Nazi crimes and communist crimes. Uh, the one who was in Wrocław, who was, it turned out to be a neo Nazi himself, and he in 2015 had gone to Donbass to fight with the Russians. And uh, in fact, was even published uh, his his communications uh, showing how he'd actually uh, it tried to do that. And there's somebody in Katowice or something was trying actually recruiting uh, to, to go them. Anyway, so uh, but but anyway, I didn't realise that the, the the trains were now paid in in Russia. I do think actually in Poland there was one thing I didn't went through in my mind uh, that I, I thought it was a bit. 
I thought it was okay for it to be going in one direction, but when I noticed there were people going backwards and forwards, there was women I spoke to um, who, who were visiting their husbands in the uh, Louvre uh, every week. I thought, well, that's that's possibly being abusing the situ uh, situation a bit. And that did go through my mind. Um, anyway, good. Uh, Guillermo writes, uh, Zhirinovsky uh, it was not a Nazi. He was an ultranationalist. He survived an assassination attempt in the in in the nineties, right? So I was Zhirinovsky being the uh, uh, I would say he was a Nazi, and um, uh, the 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 Russian um, uh, liberal democratic uh, leader. So supposedly he was the first first um, uh, political party founded in um, Soviet Union, other than the Communist Party, which I think was founded in nineteen ninety. If uh, I mean, his idea is certainly extremely, um, extremely Nazi orientated. So uh, the thing was, he actually, the irony with him was that he turned out to be half Jewish, uh, though he didn't know who his father was. And then he found out who his father was. And that, then he was, um, oh, no, no, it's, um, it doesn't count and all the rest of what counts is the mother. Anyway, uh, good. Andrew says the world isn't anti-Russian. Aren't Russian people? We simply don't agree with the war crimes put down in Ukraine. Yeah, this is a really good point because the uh, propaganda which is put out non-stop in Russia is that everybody hates us. Everybody's got it in for us. The only people we can count on are ourselves. And um, if you you can, you, uh, the thing is that now if you actually watch things. Um, it's to be understood there's a war on. But if you go back and see so some stuff in the past, but watch the Russian stuff for the Russians in Russian, and you get the constantly you get these these hosts on these programs, these opinion hosts, and in the Russia team, the the main channel, um, you get these, uh, and, and, and this is constant, 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 part of it. Everybody's against us. This is why this argument against NATO, NATO's defensive organization, Russia um, could uh, could have joined um, uh, NATO. I mean, we'd have to sort of solve some of those border disputes first and um, other changes that we'd have to make, but there's not stop it joining NATO. Um, the, the, but but it's, it's created as though NATO itself were an um, independent, sovereign country, uh, which has got it in for Russia. And that's, that's what's produced. I haven't said that, I must point out that in the United Kingdom, the same arguments are used, and they are used by people in the current government, uh, that the European Union is some kind of uh, superpower. Which has got nothing to do with the the countries around it. So and this this is I mean you look at the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, or the Sun, or something. So you get these the same arguments. And whereas it's not the same as perhaps it's not the same as saying everybody hates us as the Russians do, uh, but it's it's it, it's going that way. So I have to say that uh, that that is the same. Um, until this is resolved, I, I really think that I mean you know when I get people commenting on on my channels. Uh, about about this, I, I always I say no. I don't. I, I'm I'm really pro Russian. I really I love Russia. I hate fascism. Um, but uh, I think Russia's a great country, and I'm really disappointed uh, that I won't be able to go there again. But even last week, that is to say, four days ago, I got an invitation, um, and I really hope that I'll be able to take go. go. I mean, I, I really hope. I I don't know if that's going to be possible under the current regime. Um, anyway. Um, uh, anyway, so George says he wishes everybody a great day today. Now, George, if I remember right, he's in Melbourne, and so he'll probably be wanting to go out. He has the benefit of the day just starting, of course, it's the ninth in Melbourne, I think, right now. And here in, in Rybnik in Poland, where I am right now, it is the, it's the evening. Anyway, so Guillermo writes, being poor is not a crime and it does not produce psychosis. Communal homes existed in California due to the expense of housing. Yes, indeed, they do. Communal homes exist everywhere. Uh, but you're not, um, but you know, three people, uh, sorry, sorry, not three people, three families in one flat with a, uh, and, and the conditions of poverty that existed in Russia. I mean, I didn't say that being poor was a crime. Um, you know, I come from by British standards, a comparatively poor background myself. 
but comparatively, I said, not not under a world uh, um, circumstance. I come from a very wealthy background, by world circumstance, but by British man and from a completely poor background. Um, anyway, so you want to have to go. Uh, nice talk. I told you. Thanks for engaging with me. I, I end the war now. No more funding for Ukraine. We need that money here in the USA. Right? Guillermo, who is not from. Um, oh, sorry, because I have made the assumption Guillermo is from Spain. I don't know why I did that. But anyway, so he's from the United States. Uh, Aki, whose real name I know, uh, writes I hired six people here in my studio in Gdansk. And they didn't get anything from any of that help mentioned in the media. And I don't think we've got anything like an alternative reality on TV. Well, uh, Aki, um, that depends on which television you're watching. But if you're watching the state television in Poland, you may as well just watch uh, Rasia Team or Fox News or something. Um, I, it's great that you actually hired people um, and I know people have really tried to hire Ukrainians uh, one thing I want to say, I know I've attacked McDonald's quite a lot in, in some of the stuff I've done but um, on health and all the rest of it but I think that McDonald's has really uh, come up to the par it's, it closed, I mean, huge losses for the company for its closures in Russia and all this, this investment it's done in the country um, it has uh, anybody who worked in McDonald's automatically has the, in Ukraine has the right to work in McDonald's anywhere, as, as I understand it. So, um, so there are there are. I might even go to McDonald's just to show some support. I don't really I won't be eating the food there, of course, but I might have a drink or something, some coffee or something. Um, so, but anyway, it's great that you can employ six people in your company. Not really, uh, and I, I understand. Thing is, I would have to say, in Poland, what is good in Poland is that, that people they they arrive, and they do get a social security number immediately. So it's written all over the railway stations, uh, so you can get that. Anyway, uh, so good evening to Iron Claw. And Philip writes, we need to keep funding Ukraine. If not, then Putin will just keep on invading other countries until it gets to us. Yeah, this is how I see it. Unfortunately, what we know from uh, history uh, is that appeasement doesn't work. And I saw some good quote, which somebody said it was said by Ch Winston Churchill, but I think he made it up, but it's a really good quote. It's this, appeasement is like fee uh, feeding crocodiles, hoping that you're going to be the last one the crocodile eats. And yeah, it doesn't work. This is the problem. It just doesn't work. And I've got to say this in my own opinion, is this, is if there were a referendum in Crimea, which was fair, or Don Donetsk, or Lugansk, or Kherson, which was fair, and people voted to become Russian, I wouldn't have a problem with that. None at all. None whatsoever. Um, it's, I mean, now we can see this big, big referendums on, um, I was going to do today, I was going to do some on Ireland, actually, um, uh, but I thought, oh, I can't, I can't just think of Ireland, I thought this, this was my sort of more specialist type area, just about to come up, but, but um, if, if people in Northern Ireland vote to become part of the Republic of Ireland or Scotland, it becomes, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with that whatsoever, as long as the referendum is fair, I have no problem with them. And um, so the uh, thing is, this is what Putin's doing. It's, it, these are invasions. I must admit, I actually support it. I blame Georgia for the 2008 war. Now, now, and now I've sort of got a bit closer, done more into it. Um, I, I, I now blame Russia for it. I don't think that Georgia had um, uh, a great deal. I think, uh, of, um, I mean, maybe it could have been more passive, but then again, we, as we know, being passive. Doesn't. And one of the things is this is the more that the, um, the, uh, the more that people say, oh, we mustn't provoke him, mustn't provoke Hitler, mustn't provoke Putin, you know, the more you make it likely that provocation. But the, what Putin respects is force. Force. And um, so, I mean, if you sort of turn up, if you're the leader of uh, the United States, for example, and you turned up with a shirt on and then told him there and then that if he wants a fight, he's going to get one, Putin would understand that. And he might back down. In fact, he would back down unless he thought he was going to win. 
And uh, okay, and uh, Anika agrees. Hello, Anika. And Anika is the picture with the cat. And Otto's been watching Democracy Now! And they have a video on the concern that USA may be pushing into the war or possibly making it worse. I hope not. Yeah, actually, I've noticed on a few um, left leaning uh, channels such as Democracy I haven't seen this in Democracy Now! I haven't watched Democracy Now! in the past, but uh, I didn't know this. But there's something in the UK called, uh, sorry, it's on YouTube, uh, there's a British channel called Novar Media, and Media, some, and uh, they also promote this idea. Uh, I've been promoting sort of anti-Ukrainian things as well, which are really, uh, you know, they, okay, Putin's bad, but Ukraine's not much better, so to speak. And uh, anyway, uh, we'll see. So Otto says that uh, Putin's going to make a speech tomorrow. Well, we'll see. And that Khrushchev put push for a huge housing program in the late 50 designers to building housing complexes with community centres and stores down the street, 70 million units, and that was socialism. Yeah, yeah. I I, I worked as a developer actually as well. I don't think I did. And yeah, that's nothing wrong with that. That sounds great to me. And um, and oh, Otto says that in Russia, McDonald's is now Uncle Vanya's. Okay, so they've used the. Uh, uh, Apke writes, fun fact, those people I hired to do work that goes into tech developed for British and med medical sector. Well done. Well done, Apke. I'll have to write to you see if I can help you out in your business, actually. Might be some contact to have. Uh, Susan writes, Philip, you're ignorant or CIA. Um, um, Iron writes, some good news for me. After waiting five weeks here in Ukraine, they finally have a spot for me with a medical group. Right, so now so this has come back to me. I am is in Kiev, um, I believe, and um, yeah, so he's been hanging around, uh, waiting, and this is what happens, something, people go there, and they end up hanging around, waiting to be called up to do things, and so this is sort of part of the reasons on Poland right now, rather than being in Ukraine, and, but I know people have been there since February, February. Right, and they're still hanging around in apartments, and uh, uh, so yeah, this, this this is people are just not being not being used. Okay, so Isa says good night all. We'll see the rest later. Thank you, Alan. Isa is in Japan, and uh, yeah, that's a bit full there. Annie says uh, hello, Alan, and uh, night night, Lisa. And okay, Otto writes getting worse of Putin. So how many losses? Another ship like the Moscow Sanko. Heavily damaged, like the market. Uh, Markov, oh, forget the name. Yeah, but just a minute. What's the name of that ship? Uh, somebody write it down. The it was the admiral. The admiral. He was killed in um, on a battleship in 1905. It was named after him. This admiral built the first ever. A, a maritime service on Lake Baikal using ships manufactured in Newcastle upon Tyne, where I come from. So what's his name? Markov or something like that. He was a polar explorer. Still can't remember his name. Anyway, we'll come back. Um, anyway, so hello, Silvertone in Los Angeles. Great place there. Hugh writes, Biden is going to get us irradiated. Well, he will do if he um, appeases Pope Putin. Uh, if he gives arms to the Ukrainians, this is the best way of stopping a war happening. I'm not suggest that uh, um, that, that Makarov. Yeah, that's it. Um, um, I'm not going. I'm not suggesting that that this could, might. This definitely won't lead to nuclear war. I'm suggesting this is the best way of stopping it. Um, either that or alternative, the best way of stopping it is just giving in completely. But you know, if you're going to get, as we've seen uh, from these killings which have taken place, uh, the the uh, shocking uh, announcement which was published in Ria Novosti in March that they intend to exterminate um, large sections of the Ukrainian uh, people. Um, uh, all of these things together. Um, I mean, as far as Ukrainians are concerned, they have to fight. Uh, so you may, if you if you fight back, then you might live. And so, what would they do to us? Would they allow us to live? We don't. Well, we can't say, can we? This is what the Nazis did. They had a, a massive um, extermination campaigns uh, when people in that situation. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna die, um, if if you're killed, if you're killed by a bomb. Um, 
if it's an atomic bomb or it's a hand grenade, it doesn't make any difference to you. Uh, good, anyway, that's just how I see it. And, um, and so, uh, anyway, uh, so what I'll do is I've been rabbiting on now for around an hour. And that's been quite nice because we've got some good questions coming in. Thanks very much. Sometimes, so you know, sometimes I've done these um, lives, and I don't know what I don't know what to say. And after a while, I'm not getting, I'm not getting, I'm not getting any, um, I'm not getting the feedback sometimes. And uh, what I was thinking of doing, I wanted to do more lives, just me out, out in the street and things. But that'll be on my the the, the uh, tourism uh, channel. And um, this I have to do in the house because it's on the computer. Because on the, co on the telephone, you know, on the telephone, you only put one um, on. I thought, oh, well, hang on, I'm going to get one channel on this one that I don't use uh, because of the way the, the app's set up. So I've got two telephones, so I can, I can do one on each. But then, then it, it also turned out with problems with that as well. Anyway, um, uh, so. Thanks very much for being here. If any of you are interested in motorhomes, I've got a live uh, um, on. Sorry, no, a live a premiere. I'm not live. A premiere on that. I shall try. Before I go, we were talking about upper mincemeat a while back. I came across this. Glenford Michael was the topic for the Murder Mile podcast episode forty. It was very well researched. Right, so that, right, Dennis, right now, the Mister Glinder Michael was. Uh, a person who was found committed suicide and his body was put into a cold store and it would be used about three months later uh, as the man who never was he, he pretended uh, he was he was put, uh, put, taken by submarine and and put uh, uh, somewhere where Spanish fishermen would find him off the coast of Costa del Sol in Murcia or uh, Malaga, Malaga. And uh, then his body, uh, when they, they examined the ad there, examined his body, he had these secret things on him uh, showing that the Allies didn't intend to invade Italy, but they were going to go for Greece instead. And uh, anyway, so that's how the man never was, but it did result in an entire Panzer Division being transferred from Italy to Greece and Rommel also. He only spent a day there, but uh, he did go to Greece as well. Anyway, thanks very much to everybody uh, for watching, and um, uh, I shall. I'll, I'll try and do something tomorrow as well, if I can. So, all the best from me in Poland. Bye. Thank you. Malaga, beautiful beaches. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not beaches that good in Malaga, Christopher. I don't think the beaches are very good in Spain. The best beaches in Spain are in Galicia, uh, only the weather's not so good there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. See you. Right. Bye to everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. See you, Annie, Annika, Dennis, uh, Christopher, Ian, uh, uh, and Aki, and uh, Silva, and everyone else. Thank you.